good morning again. I don't know about you, but Sabbath morning is always a highlight of the week for me. I enjoy being in church. There's a lot of places you can be, but I think the best place to be is in church. This morning's scripture reading is taken from Genesis chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Let's bow our heads this morning for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, We know that you have put everything in scripture that is important for us to understand and know that nothing is there by accident, that each story is a lesson unto itself. Lord, be with us this morning as we look at this story of Cain and Abel. In your name we pray, amen. Isn't it nice to know that we live in an age where there are so many people looking out for us. If you have one of these, you know that a careful record is being kept of everywhere you go, of calls you make, of the contacts that you have. Somebody's keeping an eye on us. This phone will bear record that you were in Sabbath, you were in church this Sabbath morning, if you have it with you. Or not, if you're not here. I get periodic reports from Google that tells me where I've been, how long I was there, when I was there. Interesting. Interesting. If you use a credit card, there's a a trail. Where you've used that card, what your purchasing habits are, what you like, what restaurants you frequent. If you have a Facebook account, you'll notice that every once in a while you'll get an email that says, you know, you were looking for this, or you looked this up, how'd you like to buy this from us? Yesterday afternoon, we were talking at the house about bird feeders. How do we keep the squirrels off the bird feeders? We've had this discussion before. Tanya looked at her phone, and there was an email about bird feeders. Curious. Curious. There are so many people, so many companies that are so happy to keep an eye on us to watch out for us, to look out for us. Of course, we know they're not doing that for our benefit. They're doing that for our benefit, for their benefit. You know, we know as Christians that a careful record is being kept, a record that tells what we have done. And I think there's also a record kept of those opportunities that we had that we neglected to take. Opportunities that we may have had to be our brother's keeper. Genesis chapter four talks about the first two offspring of Adam and Eve. And I wanna read the whole account, it's brief. If you don't mind turning to Genesis chapter four with me, we're gonna take just a moment. And look at that real quick. I'm going to start in verse 1, and we're going to go through verse 8. I'm sorry, verse 10. And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. 
And in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted, and if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother, and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not, am I my brother's keeper? It's interesting that what we're looking at here is a story of two of the first four people to inhabit planet Earth. And we already have a murder. It's fascinating to me how quickly and how invasive sin is and how it works. Although Cain knew precisely where Abel was, he displayed a shameful tone of presumptuous impudence in his insulting reply to God. If it had not been in, on record in the pages of inspiration, we might have doubted whether a person could take such a tone when speaking directly with God. But Cain was conscious that God was speaking to him. He had heard this voice before. He heard him say, where is your brother Abel? Cain was aware that this was God, the God who knows everything. And after telling God a bold-faced lie, I know not. You can almost hear the smirk in the question that he asks God. Am I my brother's keeper? Here Cain was clearly mocking his brother Abel. Cain seemed to be saying, am I supposed to keep track of Abel the way he keeps track of these sheep? The preferred sacrifice? In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 77, God had given Cain an opportunity to confess his sin. He had had time to reflect. He knew the enormity of the deed he had done and of the falsehood he had uttered to conceal it, but he was rebellious still. The sin of murder, although relatively recent, had had a deep effect on Cain. His heart was hardened, and he was now prepared to openly defy God. This is how sin works. And it works the same with the big sins as it does for those things that we like to refer to as little sins. At first, we just want our own way. We want to be in charge. We want to be in control. We'd like to dictate the terms. We push our desires to the front. And before long, we find ourselves in open rebellion. The thing that I find most fascinating about this story of Cain and Abel is that while Cain mocks the concept of being his brother's keeper, it is the younger brother, Abel, who according to Patriarchs and Prophets, page 71, went to Cain and pleaded with his brother to approach God in the divinely prescribed way. In other words, Abel chose to be his brother's keeper. Abel chose to be an advocate for what was right. He, out of concern for his brother, made an attempt to convince Cain to repent and reconcile with God. But as is so often the case, when sin is brought to light, Abel's entreaties only made Cain the more determined to follow his own will. Throughout scripture, we find numerous examples of men and women that God put in the right place at the right time to bring the gospel message. 
to speak of reconciliation and to sound warning. We find a prime example of this in Ezekiel 3, verses 17 to 21. God is speaking to Ezekiel, and he says this, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at thine hand. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. We, like Ezekiel, bear a responsibility to those around us. We bear the responsibility to know and understand the truth and to share this truth. If God gives us wisdom or knowledge or truth or a prophetic message per se, what happens if we don't share it with someone else and they're lost? Are we accountable? It sure sounds like it. To be clear, the burden of the watchman is to warn the wicked from his wicked way. Watchmen have no policing authority. They're not to keep others on the straight and narrow and to nag and nag and nag. Am I my brother's keeper? From the fifth volume of the testimonies, the responsibilities of the watchmen of today is much greater than in the days of the prophet Ezekiel since our light is clearer and our privileges and opportunities are greater than theirs. Our responsibilities are greater because we have received more light. We have not only the canon of scripture, but we have the benefit of the spirit of prophecy and the history of prophecy that has been fulfilled that we can point to. Events are unfolding at a rapid place, pace here on planet Earth. And while many spend their time trying to avoid offending others, who claim to be experiencing a different reality than our own. Our neighbors and friends and former members are slipping farther away from the truth, never to be recovered. Incidentally, there is no my truth. There is no your truth. There is only the truth. The truth we are responsible for sharing. The Apostle Paul understood this concept. Paul was his brother's keeper. In Acts 20, verses 26 and 27, Paul says to the church, this is the uh, church in Ephesus, wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Paul came to Ephesus and he preached the truth. Not just the truth that's easy to tell, but the truth that points out error, the truth that points out sin. The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And having done so, he declared that he had filled, fulfilled his commission. What the Ephesians did with the truth was up to them, but their blood would not be on Paul's hands. Can we say the same thing? Am I my brother's keeper? Yes. Yes, I am. We as a church bear this responsibility. And God will hold us accountable if we remain silent. He will hold us accountable if we remain seated when we know where to take a stand. He will hold us accountable in this church, in this community, in this generation, if we do not declare the truth of God's word and sound the alarm. We need to be our brother's keeper. Because if we're not, we cannot keep the first of the two great commands in which, in which Christ summarized the moral law. The first great command, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. We can't possibly do this unless we have love towards our brother's soul. 
1 John 1, 1 John 4, 20, the Apostle John says, If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? How can we stand and sing about our love to God and not recognize the need of a friend for the Savior? How can we profess to support the church and, not yet, and yet not support its missions and outreach programs, its membership and its leadership? A loveless religion is good for nothing. If we don't love our fellow man enough to desire his salvation, is there any proof that we love God at all? Another sign we are to be our brother's keeper is very, very plainly drawn from the second great commandment, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now since we have loved ourselves enough to seek out and secure salvation for ourselves and forgiveness for our sins, should we not love our neighbor so well as to desire him to know his sin and seek forgiveness too? It is only right for us to secure our highest interest by laying hold on eternal life, but if we are to love our neighbor as ourselves, should we give ourselves any rest while multitudes are despising Christ and refusing salvation? From the fifth volume of the Testimonies, page 16, the end of all things is at hand. My brethren, ministers and laymen, I have been shown you must work in a different manner from what you have been in the habit of working. Pride, envy, self-importance, and unsanctified independence have marred your labors. When men permit themselves to be flattered and exalted by Satan, the Lord, Satan, the Lord can do little for or through them. To what unmeasured humiliation did the Son of Man descend that he might elevate humanity? Workers for God, not the ministers only, but the people need the meekness and lowliness of Christ if they would benefit their fellow men. As God our Savior humbled himself when he took upon him man's nature, but he went lower still. As a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Am I my brother's keeper? Amen. Absolutely. And yes, this is a spiritual responsibility. But as our brother's keeper, we also have a social responsibility. We are responsible for bringing light to this sin-sick world and, set, and sharing the truth as found in Scripture. But we also bear a social responsibility for our brother's well-being. Christ is very clear in Matthew 25, 35 and 36, For I was not hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. The righteous will ask, when did we do this? To which Christ replies, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. If I read this correctly, we need to care for others as though we are meeting the needs of Christ himself. Now, this does not absolve others of their personal responsibility. We, we like to quote 2 Thessalonians 3.10. If any would not work, neither should he eat. And this is true, or it wouldn't be in Scripture. But we need to be careful about how we apply this verse. It needs to be applied in context. And I'll leave it to you to study that. But the responsibility of Christian charity is clearly a responsibility that has been put at our feet. You know, whether it's providing relief from physical illness, food for the hungry, water for the thirsty, or the bread of life to those in need, God has chosen to complete his work on this earth through human hands and is a responsibility we bear. Am I my brother's keeper? Amen. You bet. There's still a lot of work to do. Not just in Murfreesboro, not just within our church, but within our own families, within our own communities. Many of us live outside of Murfreesboro. There's plenty of work to do. 
And while the world is wandering through a spiritual wilderness, our church here in Murfreesboro should be an oasis on earth. Over the past year, many churches closed their doors. Some have yet to reopen. Our church closed our doors for a short time, but as quickly as seemed reasonable, we opened up. And there were individuals who questioned this decision, and there may still be some who are still questioning. But why open up so quickly? I can answer that question with a question. If we believe our God is an ever-present help in times of need, that our God was able to save the Israelites from Pharaoh, David from Goliath, Daniel from the lion's den, the three Hebrews from the fiery furnace, Peter from prison, and we are relying on him to carry us through the time of trouble. How can we reconcile closing the church? The church is God's chosen oasis in Murfreesboro. The church, God's avenue through which he intends to bring the truth to the whole world. This is not intended as a criticism against anyone. This is where we stand. Simply stated, it didn't make sense to keep the church closed. So we opened up, and by God's grace, we were even able during this time to open the church school, something that had not been done in a long time, something that was divinely appointed. Christian education is the work of the Lord. It begins in the home, yes. But we have been counseled to continue this work as a church. Christian education allows us to focus on filling our children's minds with knowledge not just intelligence. And God has blessed us during this time, and I believe he will continue to bless. Amen. We are, in this hour, our brother's keeper. Amen. Amen. Ellen White says some are closing their probation, and is it well with them? Have they obtained a fitness for the future life? Will not their record show wasted opportunities, neglected privileges, a life of selfishness and worldliness that has borne no fruit to the glory of God? And how much of the work which the Master has left for us to do has been left undone? All around us are souls to be worn. But, often, but how often has the time been occupied in self-serving and the record gone up to God of souls passing to their graves unworn and unsaved? So the question must be asked, who do we need to tell? Over whom has God made us here in Murfreesboro watchmen? Who are you and I responsible for bringing the truth to? Fathers and mothers, have you told your children who Jesus is and shared the gospel message? Do we need to call aunts and uncles and cousins, maybe even our parents, and tell them who Jesus is and share the prophetic Bible truths that God has seen fit to shine on our paths? Have we visited with our neighbors and sought opportunities to share the gospel? Do we need to visit those that we have left in our lives BC, before Christ? Most people are converted and they want to get out of that old lifestyle. They, they, they need to stay away from that. They can't, they can't put themselves back in there or they'll fall back into temptation. But those people need the story that we have, Amen. the story of conversion, Amen. and they need to hear the story of redemption. What about those who have filled these pews in the past? those who have departed from the truth. How earnestly are we laboring? How earnestly are we praying for those we know? 
Just as Cain was called to account for Abel, his brother, we will be called to account for those who have been placed in our path. You know, God is omnipotent. God can do what he wants, when he wants, and how he wants. It's a nice thing about being omnipotent. I can't even do that in my own home. Nor should I. But God has chosen to do his work through us. God has invited us to be part of the plan of salvation of others. Who are we to say no? There are people within your sphere of influence that you have been appointed a watchman for. God has appointed us a place. He has invited us to participate in the saving of humanity. I want to be faithful to that calling. And I believe we all want to be faithful to that calling. I think there are times when we're a little scared. We don't know what's going to be said. We may get kicked off of one of the social media sites for sharing our thoughts. I can live with that. But this morning, when we leave this church, as we leave this little oasis here in Murfreesboro, we enter the mission field. As we go through the coming days and weeks, spending time with family and friends, we need to be intentional in our discussions. We are called to be our brother's keeper. Let's fulfill our responsibility of sharing the truth of Christ's soon return and sounding the warning to those in need. If this is your desire this morning to partner with Christ in fulfilling this calling, I invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, it is an awesome responsibility to stand in the gap. to be able to play a small part in helping to bring others to you. Lord, help us to be faithful to this calling. Help us to listen to that still, small voice when it speaks. And Lord, may we be able to grow your kingdom and help us to one day be ready to go home to heaven with you when you come. In your name, amen.